Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk building that's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member, go to rmef.org. And the podcast is also brought to you by OnX Maps. And with OnX Maps, you can know where you stand with the most accurate hunting GPS tech on the market with land ownership maps that work offline Go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 20% when you sign up for an app membership at onxmaps.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Gerber. Uh, go to gerbergear.com and learn about the knives, the vital, the big game vital, the Gator Premium, all the things that we use when we're out in the woods and not just knives, but also some really cool multi-tools that they have. We're also proud to partner with Sitka Gear. And if you go to sitkagear.com, you'll see their full line of clothing. And their tagline is turning clothing into gear. And they are doing that through advanced technology that allows you to stay in the field longer, hunt harder, and stay safer. The Elk Talk podcast is also brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. Um, the, the insider is changing how haunts and hunting information are found. No doubt about that. Use promo code ELKTALK, and when you do, when you sign up for the insider, you're going to get $50 of store credit, mad money, in their gear shop. And we are also brought to you by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the original designer and inventor of the pallet plate diaphragm that's completely changed the way elk calls are made and used. And to find out more and to order your elk calls, go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 15% on all of your elk calls and elk call accessories. And with that, Corey... We are ready to get into it. Let's jump into it. Well, Corey, thanks for letting me travel to your snowy, beautiful place here. And is this considered central Idaho? Yeah, I think central is yeah. pretty accurate. I drove up here from Boise this morning, and I've concluded I'm not tough enough to hunt here. Why is that? It's too steep and too <laughs> thick. I, at my age, I've turned into kind of a fair weather elk hunter. And fair terrain, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would hunt here, but I'm looking at how thick it is. And archery hunting, yes, I would hunt here. Rifle hunting, I don't know that I would. Eh, we've got some open stuff. You don't have to go too far to find the open rifle conducive terrain. So, All right. Well, beautiful place. It is. Really a beautiful place. Yeah. I can see why you moved here. Yeah, I was hoping we would have some elk out in the yard here, but they're not here no. today. All right. So maybe, well, they'll, maybe they'll show up before we get done. Well, if they do, we're going to have to uh, go and move the camera. That's right. So that the audience really believes. Because those listening, they're not going to see them anyhow. No, we could tell them all about the elk that are right outside the window we, if we, we wanted. We could make that story up right now. <laughs> but anyhow, we were going through our outlines of things that we think are timely based on what the elk hunter is doing each time of the year. Uh, besides hunting. Right. 
which nobody listens to podcasts during hunting season, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we hope that you're busy hunting and not listening to podcasts. Uh, our, <laughs> the sponsors probably don't want to hear that, but we, we would rather that you're out there elk hunting than worrying about listening to, to a podcast. But one of the things that I've focused on for years and years is getting a tag. Yeah. It, as fundamental as it sounds, the absolute thing you need to go elk hunting is a tag. You got to have a tag. In every state that has elk, you have to have a license and a tag. At, at least uh, that, that's been how it's worked for me. Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, there are some who try to circumnavigate <laughs> that and go without a license and tag, and I'm sure a few get away with it, but oh, don't gosh. take that chance. No, that's, uh, yeah, we're, we, we, <laughs> we don't even want to start down the road of people who do that. But yeah, That's a whole other topic. Since, since our last podcast, we, we kind of had to jump the, the gun a little bit because Wyoming today, January 2nd, yep. is the opener of Wyoming's application seasons. Season. And it runs until January 31st. Yep. And we did, we covered Wyoming on the prior podcast. So anyone who misses out on Wyoming. It's not our fault. There you go. <laughs> That's our disclaimer, folks. It's not because we didn't tell you. Yep. One of the things we wanted to do, though, is to talk about an overall strategy and then in future podcasts, backfill that with each state, how it works, why it works that way, some little tips, ideas, thoughts that you and I have uh, based on our years of applying and, and the experience that we have of maybe hunting some of those states. But Totally. Yeah, and that's... You know, my, one of my goals that I set out to accomplish several years ago was to be able to hunt, successfully hunt an elk in every Western state that allows some kind of over-the-counter or easily accessible tag for elk hunting. And Have with, you done it? With the exception of Washington and Nevada, yes. Okay. And Nevada, I'm still in the process of drawing a tag there. Washington, I will probably, I may end up hunting Roosevelt elk in Washington yeah. Uh, or I'll just go over the counter because they do have some over the counter uh, public land elk hunting there. But Washington is not a destination state for elk hunters, right. unless you're Roosevelt hunting. I think it's it's definitely a better Roosevelt state than Rocky. But yeah, so we do. I th and you've hunted. I know you've hunted Nevada. Yeah, and but I, I've not hunted Oregon. No, and you have. I've hunted it a couple times. So, so between us, we've got every state pretty well dialed in, with the exception of Washington, which. I think we've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. Yeah, That needs to be at the very bottom of your list, low on the <laughs> radar, not yeah. for hunting quality, just for the navigating the regulations and getting a right. tag. and Yeah, the cost, the everything else. And and since Wyoming or uh, Washington is later in the application season, you've almost filled your allowed time and budget yep. with what I'll call more appealing states. Totally. Uh, and so... Yeah, so that leaves, let's see, we, we'll cover Arizona and New Mexico. I'm, I'm just moving from south to north yep. here, not not by any, I guess I could, could go by. Go by deadline? Yeah, by deadline. Since it's, deadline. Right, it's right here. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got it written down too. So. Yeah, I've got it right here with the Go Hunt Insider. So it starts with Wyoming, January 31st. This year, Arizona's deadline is February 12th. And then Utah is... March 7th, followed by uh, Montana, March 15th. Which we need to take offline and talk about our plans for this fall in Montana. So, Oh, really? Yeah. Let's I've, make sure I don't forget to get a tag there. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll talk units and everything so that the audience knows where we're going to be. Right, where we're going to be. Yeah. Maybe I, they'll have I camp set up for I us. I can tell you where we're going to be. Really? It's going to be a general unit well, somewhere outside of Bozeman. Wow. That's how easy is that? <laughs> Just show up in Bozeman and follow Randy's truck, right? <laughs> Look for a gold Honda Pilot <laughs> with Museum of the Rocky license plates. That's my wife's rig. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, we got uh, after Montana, it's March 15th. Then we've got New Mexico on March 20th. Colorado on April 2nd. Uh, Nevada, April 15th. And then we get way down here to Oregon, which is 
May 15th. Yep. And then even later than that, the straggler of the entire West is your home state of Idaho. Yep. But you do find out if you drew a tag before season opens. I know. Just barely. But right. June <laughs> 5th. June 5th is a deadline. And yeah. you usually find out, I think it's about July 10th. Yeah. When you find out. Right. And a lot of people will ask me, why don't you hunt Idaho much? And for me, when we're trying to put together all of our video content, I need uh, anywhere between me and uh, guest hunters and family members and crew, I need about 12 to 14 tags a year between elk and deer, antelope, whatever. And I can't rely on Idaho as my fallback. Yeah. And it's in June because if I rolled the dice and waited until Idaho came around, I could end up with an empty sack. Yeah. I mean, I, my mailbox might not have a single tag <laughs> in it. So usually by the time the Idaho drawing deadline comes along, we've already filled our calendar yep. for the most part. And so when we apply in Idaho, it's swing for the fences, totally. man. We're, it, Go for it, the best hunt. Yeah. If you don't draw, you're already, you got a plan in place. And yeah. So those are the states I think we're going to cover, right? Yep. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's worth mentioning with Idaho and several other states, and as we get into it, we're talking about controlled draw right. hunts right here. Yeah. And a lot of these states, if you apply for a controlled hunt and you have to buy a license like Idaho, yeah. you've got the license. You might as well plan on going hunting over the counter if you don't draw your hunt. Yeah. There's no reason to buy a license and sit on it. Right. Other than I saw some grouse tracks in the snow driving up oh, to yeah. your house here. <laughs> When's your grouse season closed? Uh, I think it closed two days ago. Oh, man. I should have brought my 20 gauge and came down a couple <laughs> days early. But well, that's why I made sure and waited until after the first of the year to invite you. <laughs> I knew if you showed up at my house, all the grouse within a 20 mile radius would be dead. Keep your local chickens in town. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to cover all those in this podcast. Yep. We're, we're going to talk about overall strategies and how each of these states, how budgets of time and money, how you know, fallback options, all those come into play. Yep. Because, and why, maybe why we apply for some states and don't apply for others. Yeah. And I, I think in this podcast, the audience probably would be interested to know, because we're going to talk about generic strategy, Yeah, but I bet you they're going to want to know, well, Randy, what's, what do you do? <laughs> what do you what do you do? And Corey, what do you do? So I think when we when we get to that point, the context has to be given that I've been doing the non resident my my friend Kurt says I carpet bomb the West. That's what he calls it. <laughs> uh I've been doing that since nineteen ninety three. So uh some of the listeners I may not even have been born in nineteen ninety three. I don't know. Um, I was a senior in high school. Were you? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Gosh, I feel <laughs> old now. Uh, but the the point of that is when I first started, it's not like I had a huge budget of time and money. Yep. I said, okay. And it was quite a debate on the home front about <laughs> putting together this little kitty of money to be mailing back in the day. This was yep. before Al Gore invented the internet. So <laughs> we, we, we were doing mail-in applications, write out your check, and pray to the good Lord that you did not overlook the application fee. Yep. Because... You got all, thrown out automatically. Correct. If the exact number wasn't written on the check, you got thrown out. Yeah. So back in those days, it was pretty easy to mess up an application. Uh, and they were all done by paper. So I, I started out, I only had a couple states that I could do and a couple species. And every year I'd save a little bit more money and I'd be setting it aside. And my wife would be asking me, what, why? Are you, <laughs> what's all this money you have earmarked over here? You just don't worry about that, darling. That, and I, I'm sure as an accountant, <laughs> you didn't tell her there was a refund coming back on some of it. So you were able no. to allocate that much more the next year, right? And yeah, grow it. And, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, the the point of that the, of of that background is that I suspect it was the same for you. It's not like one day I said I'm going to do this, and all of a sudden I had this huge budget of of money yep. and time that I could throw at it. I, I knew that it was going to be 
a longer term plan and process. Yep. And I, I hope that those listening look at it that way. That okay. Well, you've said many times the goal is that people hunt elk. As often it, as they can. Yeah. At, every at, year. I mean, ideally, and I know for some that's not realistic, but at least every other year. Yeah. Because I think in one of the podcasts you mentioned that one of the tragedies is that people don't build up a, a vault, uh, an encyclopedia of elk hunting experience, and then they draw the glory tag. Yep. And, and they don't have a quality experience because they don't have any experience. Yeah. Now that you don't want to cut your teeth on a early rifle tag in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, you maybe. Want, yeah, but I mean, the reality is you're going to be better served if you've got years of failure yep. uh, leading up to that point. Yep. It'll make that hunt seem easier and it will be much more rewarding. Yeah. So for me, I, and even back then, I started out with a short term, a midterm, and a long term plan. And what would that be? 25 years ago, 26. Ah, wow. this will be, tw it'll be 26, 26 this years season. from this season. And since then I've cycled through my Nevada points, my Utah points, my Arizona points. I would say those were my long-term swing for the fences sort yeah. of uh, plans. And I did not expect Colorado to be a long-term plan when I started. At the time, you could draw... I think Colorado had started their point system in 88 or 89, something Was it that like long that. ago? Yeah. And so I wasn't... I didn't feel I was that far behind the curve. Well, it took 20 points before... Well, I, I didn't add Colorado to the mix, I don't think, until 96. So... It, or maybe 95, I burned 19 or 20 points in 2006 because of point creep. I thought this was going to be a, okay, every three years, I'm going to be right. burning through the Colorado system. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so Colorado started out as a short-term or mid-term option, and it ended up being a long-term option yep. because I ended up in what most people call no man's land. Yeah. Not enough for those premium units in the northwest corner of Colorado. And so you just, every year you'd punt and say, oh, yeah. hey, I'll just send on my money and get another point and get another point. It was um, the same for me with Colorado. We put in, I don't remember when we started, I've got 17 or 18 points now. Now you yeah. do? Oh, and I bet when and, you started. Oh, we, you, were looking, we were looking at drawing, you know, unit two, unit 10, northwest corner, and I think it was seven or eight points as a non-resident to draw those hunts when we put in. So our strategy was we'll build up to eight or 10 points and draw the premium hunt in the state. Yeah. And I'm still 10 years behind. <laughs> you know, I haven't gained any ground since I started putting in. Yeah. And it's you know, that point creep you talk about every year. It takes one more point to draw those premier hunts. And, you know, it's a whole nother discussion about bonus points, preference points, and right. whether they're worthwhile or not. But just know that if you're going to play the game, it's if you're looking at it right now and you say, I want to hunt this unit and it takes eight points to draw in eight years, it's probably going to take 12 to 16 points to yeah. draw. So you got to kind of plan that into your strategy, which I don't think you and I either one did when we started in it. No, I, I didn't really. And at the time, Wyoming did not have a non-resident point system when I started that. Uh, I think their point system came in place in 2005, something like that. Um, and since then, uh, I always viewed Wyoming as a short-term strategy that within three years, I was going to burn through my points. Yep. And I've been able to do that a few times in Wyoming. I've hunted twice in the Big Horns, uh, once in central Wyoming, so uh, and once in the Wind Rivers. So I've had... Since Wyoming started their point system, and I apply in the special draw, which we'll get, we covered that yep. last podcast with Wyoming, uh, I've burned through four hunts wow. in, in Wyoming, uh, which, you know, that's an average of about every three years, yep. which is kind of what I expect in a state like Wyoming. Um, this year, I'd, I'm at one point, I, I don't know what I'll do. 
And we've hunted Wyoming six times in the last eight years. Really? Yeah. Wow. And they've all so, been, you know, just general, right. general tag, but, general hunt. But it's, yeah. You, it's, you guys have done remarkably well. Yeah, it, it's good hunting. It's tough hunting. You know, we talked about it in the Wyoming podcast. But the beauty of Wyoming is you can draw a good hunt. You know, it's not, I'm not going to say a quality hunt where you're going to shoot a 300 inch bull every year or anything like that, but you can have a, a good elk hunting experience in Wyoming. And there's several other states as well. Um, but it is a draw hunt, but it's one of those short term yeah. strategy locations for me. Yeah. Well, that's, that's how I've always looked at Wyoming. Um, and I will always view Wyoming as a short-term thing. There's yeah. just way too many good hunts in Wyoming that can be had with three, four, at the most five points. In yeah. your case, you're talking that general tag, you know, sometimes one or two points. Uh, and the, I have this irrational fear that I'm going to die with points in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Burn them up. <laughs> yeah. So short-term, uh, I use Wyoming as one of my short-term strategies. And, and you live in Idaho, me in Montana, folks who live in Wyoming, folks who live in Colorado, they can use their home state as kind of their short-term strategy. Right. Or their um, guaranteed backup. You know, if you apply, for instance, if we apply for Wyoming this year and don't draw it, I know I can buy an over-the-counter tag right here out my back door and go hunt. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I I think where I'm, I, I explained that Colorado was intended to be a short-term strategy and it became a long-term strategy. I went, I was in the short term for the long term. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things in business school they teach you. If you're in the short term for the long term, you probably are going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just how it worked out in Colorado. But now that I've kind of washed all those points off my my board on Colorado, uh, I, I view Colorado as another short term. Yeah. Um, I don't see ever having more than two to three points in Colorado. Um, right now I'm sitting on two points going into this year. Uh, depending on what I find out in Wyoming, uh, I I might just go for one of the early rifle hunts in Colorado. Not because they're fantastic hunts, it's just lower tag numbers. And so it's a higher quality experience. Yep. You're, you're, being realistic is one of the to me <laughs> is one of the keys to having a fun hunt yeah if you say oh i'm gonna go and burn two points in colorado and i expect to shoot a 340 yeah. inch bull well it could happen but odds Probably are not. yeah odds are your expectations are going to result in frustration yeah so um well so on the, the flip side of the the short term long term you know colorado was your short term it took you 19 20 years I was kind of the, the opposite looking at Arizona. Mm -hmm. And Arizona was my long-term strategy. It was the first state I started applying for and building points in, anticipating, you know, back in 2000 or so, so 18 years ago, 19 years ago, that it would take eight or 10 points to draw a good quality archery rut hunt. Yeah. And we drew the first time with four points and then drew again with three points. So my Rife, ru, er, September rifle rut tag, September archery rut tag, or uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So we we got lucky, you know. We clean living, my friend. Well, it was uh, it was due to somebody else's errors both times. So oh, we okay. took advantage of that, and you know, my I was looking at it as, hey, by 2010, somewhere in there, we're going to hunt Arizona for the first time. Yeah, and we drew a tag in 2005. Wow. completely unprepared. That was back when they came out. I think it was July when you found out if you drew Arizona. Right. Yep. And so I only had a month and a half, two months to put together an out-of-state, my first out-of-state hunt for elk, and it happened to be Arizona Unit 1. Wow. And had an incredible hunt, saw, it opened my eyes to what there was outside of my little backyard in Idaho. Yeah. And it made it hard to come back and hunt <laughs> over the counter in Idaho. <sighs> and, you know, the, the second we got back, we already had a plan in place. We're going to put in again and we're going to build up. And yeah, it'll take eight or 10 years, but it'll be worth it. And we drew a three points. Wow. And again, went, went into that hunt with better expectations of the hunt itself and realistic expectations of what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah. And had an incredible hunt. 
Yeah. I know I'm back at 10 points in Arizona <laughs> and I, I think we could draw according to Go Hunt. I just got on there last week. We could probably draw this year, but I'll probably wait and, and hold off another year. Wow. So. It, you see, you still have patience. I, uh, Mine's more of a calendaring okay. thing. So. Yeah. But the other thing that you have is you have teenagers. Yeah. I don't. I I've, I only had one, which most people say if you only have one kid, you're really not a parent because they don't have anyone <laughs> to fight with, and and you're going to blame the right kid. It, it's it, always their fault. You've got three. Yeah. So you you got your hands full at this point. It, right now, it's uh, it seems like our hands are very full. Yeah. But, but come September and October, um, I have a I have a truckload of hunting partners too. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, it does extend my time in the field because my wife is very supportive of. If you take one of the kids to go do something, go and do something. Yeah. And so it makes it uh, enjoyable for both of us, I think. Yeah. Cool. Well, I started out with Arizona as a long-term strategy. And is 10 years long-term? I think 10 plus, I would I would That's consider long-term. that my long-term. So my 10th year in Arizona, I drew. And I didn't want to draw. I think I may have... I've said this on podcasts before. I'm not sure if I've said it on ours, but 2005, the year you're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, that was a year Arizona got sued. By United States Outfitters out of right. New Mexico. They right. sued them for discrimination against non-residents. Right. And so that resulted in Congress actually passing a bill that said, you know what, states can discriminate to kind of confirm what the Supreme Court had already said. Anyhow, that year, Arizona got rid of the non-resident cap. Yeah. So, uh, and it's important to mention that they had already conducted the draw that year yeah. and then were sued and had to go and add right. additional tags. So right. the, the quote on all the tags was 40% higher because of that. Yeah. And so I, I had Nevada as a long term plan also, but Nevada took my elk points at seven points in 2005. <laughs> so, Nevada, I find out in May that I've drawn. I call my buddy Jerry in Arizona and say, hey, I, I can't deal with two premium elk tags. <laughs> what, what would you suggest I do? And that was back before you had the quality and depth of information yep. that's at our fingertips today. And Jerry, who's from Williams, Arizona, says, well, apply for unit 10 late rifle or early <laughs> rifle. You'll never draw that. As a non-resident, you only have 10 points. So, okay, that's what I did. I ended up with two elk tags. That two long-term plans became reality in the same year, 2005. Wow. I had an early rifle rut tag in Unit 10. And then I had one of the November Nevada hunts. So even though you, uh, the point of all these examples is even though you say, all right, this is my short-term, yeah. mid-term, long-term, your long-term might become short-term or mid-term and your short-term might become mid-term or long-term. Totally, yeah. So, which is to me why I apply in as many states as, uh, even along the way, I was applying in as many states as my budget would allow. Uh, How often do you get the question, well, what happens if you draw two tags in the same year? (laughs) You know, we get that a lot and it's happened a couple times. And it puts me in a a bit of a bind because I do... You know, I try to be, and I say this, and if my wife's listening, she's going to come <laughs> running and say, did you really just say that on the podcast? I try to be respectful of the time that I'm away from home. Yeah. Especially because September, I would love to fill all 30 days with hunting elk in September because they only bugle for so long. Yeah. Um, but I also realize right now in the, the time we're in in life and, you know, where, where we are with our children, I need to be here. Yeah. And it's not that I don't want to be, I don't want to make sense. Right. Like I wish I was hunting all the time, but... Um, I do have to be considerate of that somewhat. And so I do try to um, maybe go for a big hunt and go for a a mid-range, mid-term type hunt. And then knowing I probably won't draw the big one, there's a chance I'll draw the mid one and then I'll have over the counter. And if I do happen to draw both of them, I can make two hunts happen and still be able to come home for a week or 10 days in between and yeah, make sure things are good here. So I can, I can handle two decent 
hunts where I have to invest some time. You know, right. if I drive Arizona, I don't want to go down there for five days. Right. I want to be down there for 10 or 12 days and make sure I'm putting in the time for that quality type of a hunt. Um, but if I was to draw Arizona and Nevada, both in a September time frame hunt, it would be, it would be difficult. Yeah. Well, that's where some of the states have a pretty liberal policy of returning yeah. uh, tags. And Arizona now has the new point guard system. It's almost like insurance for, what is it, $5? Yeah, 5 or 10 Something. Yeah. That if you draw and you can't make it once every five years, you can turn your tag back in and get your point restored. Yep. Yeah. So that's an option that is just new in the last two or three years. Uh Nevada lets you turn your tag in right up, I think, until the day season starts. Yeah. Uh, so I've actually heard of people going down and scouting the unit they drew the week before the hunt opens and not seeing the quality of animals they want or it being too hot or dry, and they call and turn their tag back in the day before season. Really? Yeah. Huh. Never went that far. Yeah. <laughs> and then Colorado has this new returned license list. Uh, I'm not going to get into great depth on that because I want <laughs> I want to have a few secrets <laughs> other than you can turn your tags back in, in Colorado now. Uh, and you have been able to for a while. Utah, I, this is, I thought it was a, a crank call. 2014, yeah. I come back from my daily hike. Look, there's a, I'm one of the people who still has a voicemail or an answering machine on a landline. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're laughing. Uh, that's a, if my wife is listening, she's going to say, quit talking about that because it's the, the crux of much of our marital <laughs> debate. Uh, is anyhow, she for or against the answering machine? She's for it. Okay. I hate it. But the reason she was, little side note, the reason she was for it is that her mom liked to call on that line. Well, her father passed away in October. And now her mom is living with us. So I've got some leverage here. I'm getting rid of that landline. But anyhow, I come in and I look, there's a new message since I'd left the house. I click on it and it's like, hello, this is so-and-so from Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, someone has turned back their archery elk tag and you are next in line. Please call by this day or you will go to the next person. <laughs> I stopped. I'm like, you're kidding me. What? What? I looked at the calendar. Boy, I got a full calendar this year. I don't care who who else is going to draw elk in uh, Utah with yeah. five points or whatever I had. I'll never draw five points. Yep. Yeah, I'll take that tag, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my credit card. <laughs> so there are some of those options that are out there that might make your long-term plan a shorter-term yep. plan. Or it might change your plans in the middle of your planning yeah. process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because here in Idaho, you guys have that second draw. Yeah. And honestly, if, if the Idaho fishing game wanted to make more money, yeah. they wouldn't publish the draw odds for that because you don't have very good odds no. of drawing because there's one or two tags that don't get picked up. In Idaho, right. if you draw a tag, you have to pick it up and purchase it by August 1st, right. regardless of when the hunt opens. And if you don't, those tags get forfeited and go back into a second draw pool right. and they publish a list on about the, I don't know, 10th or so of August and you have until the 15th to apply for them. It's a very short window and you apply and you might pick up one of those tags. So you can actually apply for the same tag twice if there are leftovers, but for the most part in the really good units, and it still surprises me, there was a unit 54, which is the premier archery unit for elk in Idaho. Yeah. There was a tag left over last year or the year before that somebody didn't pick up. There's only There were only five tags issued for the unit at one point. I think there's 15 now, but that tag didn't get picked up, and it went into the second draw. And I, I'm, I don't even remember. I think there were 1,500 or 1,800 people put in for that one tag in the second draw. Uh, so it's not very good odds, but there is an opportunity to draw yeah. a tag that didn't get drawn the first round. I always apply in your second draw because I've already bought my license yeah. to apply in the first draw. So what is it? Five dollars? Six bucks. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, I look at it as though I'm just buying a raffle ticket. Yep. And somebody's got to draw it. And yeah. every year I know somebody who draws a, a leftover tag. So yeah. So those are the, I guess the, the whole point of that part of the discussion is to have people thinking about 
all right, how, what's my short-term strategy for where I can go hunting every year? Yep. And that those sometimes become the same as your fallback options. Yeah, and over-the-counter, you know you can buy a tag in Idaho or in Colorado or in sometimes Montana. Yeah. Those are, like you say, it's a fallback. And for me, that's my, every year I'm going hunting. And those are the, the states and the tags that I'm counting on if I don't draw anything at all. Yeah. And with that, my my midterm ones are a little bit more flexible in what and how I do it. Sometimes it becomes a midterm option just because my calendar hasn't allowed for a, for it to be a short term yep. option. Uh, it's very possible that Wyoming or Colorado could migrate from a one to three year short term option to a four to nine year midterm option yep. just because um, you don't get an opportunity to use the points because you're filled on your schedule and that right. point rolls over and yeah whatever you do if your budget allows it don't pass on buying a point yep. or acquiring a point because you'll regret it someday yep. down the road there's a thread out on my hunt talk forum right now of what would you do differently <laughs> if you knew today or if 20 years ago you knew what you you know today. Yeah. Almost every reply has been, I would have started acquiring points sooner. In fact, Kirby from Colorado said, if they start selling points for skunks, I'm buying points because you <laughs> never know when some law, some rule is going to change where you can apply your skunk points towards an elk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, you know, going back to the, the whole bonus point discussion, so many states start down that road not real not looking ahead 20 years right and they have to make changes to the system and it always makes people upset because you've invested for 15 years and all of a sudden the carpet gets pulled out from under you arizona did it mm -hmm. you know they went from their normal 10 percent cap on non-residents to allowing more in the in the first round pool right and that changed it it made i think three to four years longer to draw tags now because fewer tags are for the guaranteed preference round. Right. And that happened to us. We were sitting on three years ago enough points to draw the unit we wanted to draw, and now it bumped it out three or four more years. And yeah. And my backup plan, so when I drew Arizona, I was going to draw a quality hunt, and then from there, I was going to go every three or four years and draw another tag in Arizona for a lesser quality hunt, but still, it's Arizona. So yeah. you can still say quality right. in that sentence. And now that, that unit that used to take three points to draw takes seven or eight points to draw because of that change. And so they're, each of these systems are not necessarily they're, set for eternity. Yeah, they, they are dynamic rather yeah. than static. And that's just, you have to go into it knowing that's a possibility. Yep. It just, it's an investment. <laughs> I mean, it's like any investment. Yeah. There is risk and you might... Go into an over-the-counter situation after investing 10 points in a state. Yeah. Well, the two states that don't have points that we're going to talk about are New Mexico and Idaho. So if you're new to the system and you feel you're way behind the curve, yeah. think about New Mexico because $65 refundable license. I still don't understand why New Mexico makes that a refundable yeah. license for non-residents. In other words, when you apply... You can check the box that says, if I don't draw one of the permits, refund my license. Yep. And so you end up paying an application fee and a small, maybe a small transaction yeah. fee. Some, it, it, yeah, you got to front all the money, but boy, it sure is a cheap place to play the game if you've got enough to front the money. Yep. Yeah, you front right. the money, send it all in. If you draw, you're already paid. You get the license and tag and you go hunt. Right. If you don't draw, you can choose to get everything sent back. And and for me, I would never go to New Mexico if I didn't draw an elk tag, at least right. in my current you know application strategy. Yeah. So I would take the refund yeah. and get it refunded. Of course, the last time I checked the box I wanted a refund, you and I drew and <laughs> they charged my credit card. So. Uh, well, that probably won't happen again anytime <laughs> soon. So don't, don't block that out on your calendar. Uh, but that's where, for me, New Mexico ends up higher for new applicants with no points yeah. than Idaho because Idaho... You have to buy the license. You have to buy the non-refundable. Yep. Where New Mexico is refundable, Idaho it's non-refundable. And it's $100 not, more. Yeah, it's $160. So 
it, back to your point earlier, if you're going to apply in Idaho, make it your fallback option yeah. because you've already a, bought the license. Apply for a limited entry tag, and if you don't draw, make that your fallback option where you're just going to go. Yep. Buy the, or over if you know you're coming to Idaho and you're already guaranteed to buy a license, right. put in for the draws. Before yeah. you buy your tag, put in for the draws, you know, shoot for the moon, try to draw right. a quality hunt. If you don't, you have the license, you buy your over-the-counter tag and go hunt. Yeah, you're going anyhow. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Well, how, we, earlier we were talking about, before we turned on the camera, how much money we think is reasonable for someone to start out with. Kind of like if you... You need your little pool, yeah. your pot, your whatever you want to call it, to at least start building points and give yourself a chance to start with a short term, mid term, and long term option. Yep. And and uh, you you know your initial was two thousand dollars, which yeah. I think there's going to be some sticker shock for most right. elk hunters wanting to get started in that. And I think we we realized that a lot of those applications don't overlap that you'll have your refund back before you have to apply for the next one. Yep. So I think you can cut that pool in half and, you know, $1,000 set aside will get you into a pretty good strategy. But I would even say you could get away with less than that and still build uh, right. a good plan. Yeah. And the reason that it's, I think, of, I, I would say 1000 is a minimum is, and I'm just going to walk through the calendar. Okay. Apply in Wyoming, because that's first out of the shoot. You're going to have to front the regular price fee, yep. which I should know that off. Top Seven hundred and eighty-three dollars, okay. I think. So. And then you're going to have to this year. You're going to have to add two and a half percent for a transaction fee. Yep. So that's going to just off completely. You know, gone is twenty of that. Plus, you're going to want to buy a point, which is the point fee 50. still fifty bucks. Yeah. Okay. So right there's seventy dollars of your thousand gone as a fixed cost, whether you get a refund yep. because you didn't draw it or not. Yep. So you will know about that in, let's say, I think the last February, or last February Friday 22nd, February. I think yeah. last year was when we found yeah. out for Wyoming. Yeah, it's usually the last February, last, February, <laughs> last, last Friday, February Friday <laughs> last, last Friday in February. Uh, sometimes it's a Monday, but anyhow, you will know. The bad part is the Arizona deadline is before that. Yeah. In Arizona, uh, you're going to be fronting a license cost there of another, I think it's like 163, a, something, something like that. Like that. And yeah. then you got a $15 application fee. So if you want to play the Arizona game, you don't have to front all the money, but you do have to buy the non refundable license. Yeah. So if, if, if I had $1,000 to work with, I would do the Wyoming thing. Um, I may not front the $50 for the point right away because you can do that later in the year. You can do that in July. Yep. So that way if I, I, I'm out less upfront money. So I'm out 800 bucks. I can do Arizona and I can buy my non-refundable license, my application fee, and it's going to eat up most of the rest of my thousand dollars until my Wyoming refund comes back in yep. March. So... I would be playing those two. This is, this is just Randy going yep. through if I only had a thousand bucks. So, and I'm going to go on the premise that I didn't draw. So, all right, I didn't draw Wyoming. I get my money back. I'm going to use that same money to apply in New Mexico because there's no point system. I'm not, I, I, like we were just saying, I can get my $65 license fee back and I got to front everything. So, so you use that eight hundred dollars that you get back from Wyoming to now apply. It's about the same price, I think, yep. in New Mexico. The tag is yep. seven something, something like that. So I, I'm going to be real close. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to roll the dice and see what happens there uh, in New Mexico. I'm going to find out sometime in May. Uh, the only remaining draw deadline that I could take advantage of, if I wanted to, would be Idaho after that um i'd probably wait and see what happened in new mexico so now i've i've built points in arizona i've built points in wyoming and i've got my hat in the ring in three states wyoming arizona and new mexico three quality elk states right too. yeah 
and I'm still in it for a thousand bucks. Now, if I had two thousand dollars, I would also add. I, I'd well, since Colorado changed it last year, you only got to send in the itty bitty little amount. Yeah. I'm gonna go dig. I'm gonna shake the couch Find upside another 40 down. Bucks and... Yeah, somehow I'm finding that minimal amount to at least buy a point in Colorado. Yep. That leaves out of the picture uh, Utah and Nevada um, and Montana. And the reason that I, if I was on a thousand dollar budget, that Montana wouldn't be there is the general tag. It's over 80, sometimes yeah. 90% draw results. So building points in Montana really isn't that helpful as an on-resident. Um, you could, every year you you have really good odds of drawing it when it fits your budget. Nevada and Utah are just such long, odd kind of just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can draw a tag in either of those states because... Right. It's a bonus system, so it's just, you know, you have a chance in every every draw, but the reality is there's so few tags and so many people putting in that your chances are just incredibly low. Really low. And Nevada, you're paying, I think it's a $150 upfront license fee yep. plus application fees. Utah, you're paying, I think, a $60 license fee. maybe, yeah. Something. And then you're paying application fees. So those two states, if you're on a tighter budget, of a thousand or two thousand dollars those are such long-term uh opportunities and so expensive up front they would be the last on my list if i was working from a a limited budget totally um so what else does that leave oregon yeah oregon which yeah it's take it or leave it yeah I mean, it's one of the, Oregon has a lot of opportunity. Oregon has right. a lot of over-the-counter tags for both Roosevelt and Rocky Mountain Elk. Uh, the draws in Oregon, you know, you've got the Wenaha, you've got Mount Emily, you've got, you know, a handful of units up in that area that are good. But it's kind of the same thing. You used to be able to draw the Sled Springs unit archery for two to three points as a non-resident. When I first started putting in, I drew it with 10. And it's at least that now. And so looking at that hunt, it's not a 10 point quality hunt. Yeah. You spend 10 points on that, you're going and hunting. There's a lot of other people there. There's limited access because of the timber company that owns most of the unit. And so it's just the, the draws in Oregon, you've got to buy the license. Um, yeah. It's just, it's kind of like Nevada, Utah situation. Don't put in Oregon for the draws. But if you want to hunt Oregon over the counter, you might as well put in for the draws and build a point since right. you're buying the license anyway. Right. If you view Oregon as your fallback safety yep. net option, yeah, then build do points. it. But to just do it for the purpose of building points, yep. I'm not very price sensitive when it comes to this stuff. At this point in life, yeah. you know, when your kids are out of college, your house is paid off, all these other financial obligations are taken care of. And your you pr- live your, to hunt. <laughs> yeah, your price sensitivity gets to be a lot wider. Yeah. But even at that, limited entry draws in Oregon, I bailed in 2007 or 8, yeah. whatever it was. I just, I could not justify it. And I'm still fair. doing it, and I, I don't know exactly why, uh, <laughs> other than Old I did hear about, I, I heard about a unit that doesn't take too many points to draw that has some potential. Okay. And so I've already got enough points to draw it. It's just a matter now. I'm just sitting on those points until it can fit it in my calendar to go there and check it out. Well, we just walked through what all you could do with a thousand dollar budget. Yeah. And as your budget increases, because you're each year you're kind of rat holing a little more and a little yep. more and a little more, probably within three or four years, you're going to be at a point where you've squirreled away enough money that you could add Nevada, you could add Utah, you could, you know, maybe Montana becomes your, hey, I'm going to go there yeah. every year kind of thing. And I think, so, you know, even stepping back, maybe if you don't have a thousand dollars, there's still options mm-hmm. and it may not get you in the draw necessarily, but you can start building points. Right. And that's, that's really what I did with Arizona. When I started, I wasn't planning on drawing. Yeah. I, you know, when I drew the tag, it was like, 
oh gosh, my credit card just got hit. Now I've got to cover that. You know, so it, it, I wasn't counting on drawing right then. I was just planning on sending them my $160 every year. And back then I think it was 130 or 140. And when you do that, you get a point. And so I was just planning on doing that, buying the license and building my point. So I was investing $150 a year in Arizona. And from there I expanded. So you could easily not even buy a license, not even apply, but buy an elk point in Wyoming for $50. Yep. You can buy a point in Colorado for 40, 35, 40, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. You can buy a point, um, you could do it in Utah. I wouldn't suggest it just because right. it is so long-term that even though it's inexpensive to buy the point, yeah. there's really not a need yeah. to. So I would at least be buying points in Colorado and Wyoming for less than $100 a year. And building those so that in four or five years, when you are ready to draw, when you have $1,000 set aside to buy the license on the tag and go on a hunt, you've got the points and you're ready to go. Yeah. So at the very least, I would do that. Oregon's $160 for a point, which I probably wouldn't put that high on my list. Um, Montana... They now, changed it, yeah, I know. Yeah, Montana. I should know Montana. I live there, but I apply as a resident. So yeah. I thought last year or the year before they made it so you could buy a you point. You can buy a point now. Only. And it used to be you had to buy the license, which the yeah. combo or the the elk non-resident license was, what, $800? Something. We, we wrote the book on how to lay the leather to non-residents. They did. I just remember getting my refund of 80% of my application to be able to get a point. So it was $160 yeah. just to maintain my point, point after I'd applied. Yeah. And that was my only option for building points in Montana. Yeah. They've, they have changed it. So it's much more user friendly now to get a point there. Yeah. Well, I, what I'm looking at here you know, on my laptop is Go Hunt has really good strategy articles. Yeah. Uh, this one is top over the counter elk hunting opportunities in the West, which is kind of a fallback. Um, and then it's got uh, an article about short and long-term uh, strategies for acquire, for hunting elk every year. And uh, I don't know if Brady stole this from us. Or <laughs> did, maybe we're going to have to read this in more detail and see if he's uh, plagiarizing. I, I'm sure he's not. But yeah, yeah. That, so you're, you're uh, saying somebody could just sign up for Go Hunt Insider and not have to sit here and listen to us for an hour talk yeah, about it. They probably could. Uh, <laughs> but they also wouldn't get the perspectives and the little tidbits. Well, maybe they would. They're, well, there's so many articles. They I probably know. could. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, I, they wouldn't get your personal application right. strategy. Exactly. Even though Brady and Chris and those folks at Girl Hunt have asked me, would you chronicle your application <laughs> strategy for through the year? I'm like, oh, no, then people are going to know unit numbers yeah. and everything else. But uh, sometimes I have, and I'll use it New Mexico, for example. You I have tell them the unit number? No. <laughs> I was uh, say, I'll tell them the unit number that we applied for. Well, it's a, people know that. It's out yeah. on YouTube. Because uh, we were, it turned out to be such a hard hunt. We're like, everybody should yep. apply here. <laughs> no, that's, what, that's where I was going with this is we aren't applying necessarily for these home run units. No. We're kind of taking a chance a lot of times that here's a unit that might have some potential that's easier to draw. And a lot of times we get there and find out our over-the-counter backup option would have been 10 <laughs> times better. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Last year was, I drew archery in New Mexico again. I drew my first choice. I did not expect that. I, I need What I need to do is party app. Every time I party app in New Mexico, I draw. When I go individually, I never draw. No. And I'm sure someone will come up with a conspiracy <laughs> theory about that. But uh, last year, went down there. It was so tough, so hot. And... Marcus, my camera guy, him and his wife in Montana on general tag shot two bulls the first weekend. Yeah. And we're scratching our heads saying, why did we just drive 1,300 miles and drag llamas down here into this hot, <laughs> forbidden country? We should have stayed at home. We probably would have killed them. Yeah. But a, and I think that's your plan for this fall, right? <laughs> it is my plan for this fall. I'm not leaving Montana to go somewhere else for archery elk season. I, if you if Montana's on your list, our archery elk season is the best elk hunting in Montana, well, way better than the rifle hunting. You get like 
70 some weeks don't you <laughs> hunt archery it's, uh, it's only six cory but only if, six, uh, if you're an elk it probably seems like 70 yeah. that someone's out there harassing you or if you're a, a hunter's spouse waiting at home for well, that's your spouse true. to come back from elk hunting it might seem like 70 weeks but. yeah but uh, new mexico i have a short mid and long term strategy within my application because you get three choices. Yep. My first choice in New Mexico is, it depends on what my calendar allows for. Most years is a swing for the fences. My second choice is, a, you know, pretty decent odds. Or, uh, as, as good as maybe odds can be for yep. a state that only gives 6% of their tags to the self-guided non-resident. And then my last choice is usually... A, Hey, at least I'm going. Yeah. Kind of option. So you can almost have a short, mid, and long term strategy within your app, your application yeah. for that state, at least for states that let you look at multiple choices before they go on to the next person. And New Mexico, do they look at first four? First, first three. 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 And Arizona looks at your first two, two choices. Nevada looks at your first, you, know, you get five choices in Nevada before they go on to the next one. Those are the only states I think that put multiple you, and have a chance of drawing your second choice. Right. And, all yeah. the rest of the states, I believe, look at all the first choice applicants. Yeah. And then after everyone's first choice is filled or not filled, then they say, are there any tags that didn't get filled yep. in those units? And that's what we'll do as the second choice. And uh, keep in mind, we're talking elk applications. Right. Some elk. states are completely different between their elk application and their mule deer <laughs> and antelope. Different <laughs> dates, different uh, yeah. formats that they draw, all of that. That's so we're talking crazy. specifically elk. elk draws. Right. Yeah, Don't don't take this as the gospel if you're going to go and apply for some other species in some yep. of these states you might end up <laughs> disappointed you might miss a deadline you I, might. I don't see the the box for mule deer or antelope here <laughs> yeah. yeah well do you want do you want to get into arizona on this podcast i think we, arizona can be its own you know, i think we can there's enough to talk about with arizona and the way that they do the draws and everything there we can uh make that circle back around and give some more specifics on arizona okay are, are, you, are you wanting my I, I was gonna say let's let's talk specifics here all right you and, want, and, so uh, what i should do is i i have on a flash drive here if I ever lose this flash drive, <laughs> it'd be as bad as losing my GPS. On here is, I brought this, just worried that you might ask me to do this. It's everything, every unit I'm considering for every state this year. Broken down by how many points, what the draw odds uh, are. Everything. It's, it, it is not healthy to be this obsessed with drawing tags i'm sure that <laughs> if my wife saw well she knows i spend an awful lot of time on this stuff so she's probably thinking well if it keeps him happy what do i really care um, <laughs> keeps him out of my hair um but specifics you know i i'm like i've said i'm a resident of montana so that becomes pretty much my fallback option it it's something that I know I'm going to have every year. and But even with that, in my home state of Montana, I've got a bit of my own swing for the fences idea sure. because I, I know I'm going to get my general tag. So, and our general archery tags are really good. So I apply for some pretty difficult hunts in my own home state. And difficult to draw hunts. Yes. And, and yeah, I'll go back to that and say that draw odds as a general rule are a function of multiple things. Access, yep. whether it's public, private access or topography. Uh, you take units that have big chunks of public land, easy going. Those are going to be really, really hard to draw. Yep. You take ones that have some private public problems or just nasty. Vertical. Yeah. Those are going to be easier. Um, I look at some of the units in Colorado. It's like, why is that one so easy to drop? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of 14ers there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all wilderness or something. Um, a lot of times, I look at what the resident draw odds are. 
Because the residents know. They know. And I, why am I saying this? This is one of my little <laughs> un, unshared secrets prior to now is people will ask me, why did you apply in that unit? Well, have you seen what the resident demand is? Yep. They know something. The locals know. Yeah. Don't just rely, and, and this this is another thing on my list of what can impact the uh, ability to draw is these research services and application services, they, they serve a purpose. Um, you see that? I do. <laughs> and as much as I like spreadsheets, that looks very confusing. Uh, that looks really messed up, doesn't it? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is all the units being considered by species, by so elk. I was going to say, it's, so, it's so, not just elk. It's a great big title at the top of the spreadsheet. Yeah, what does it say? Year of the elk. Yeah. So you're focusing on elk this year. I am. Uh, and then the first column is all the elk for each state and where we're going to apply for me, for Matthew, for Uncle Larry, and then all my guest hunters down here. <laughs> Bo Beatty, Ed Eason, Mason, Ryan, uh, Kurt, Jim. Why am I, I not on you're there? You're not on there because I can never pin you down to anything. Whatever, we made a plan. I know. We've so, got a plan. So Why am I not on that list? Well, you, I, you'll I'm be your, on the I'm list. your fallback? Kind of. Sorry, don't mean to break it to you that way. But. Well, it just dawned on me. What happens if you fill your elk tag in September? Then you come and fill your elk tag. Well, so that's easy enough. Yeah, I, but, so maybe I'll be rooting for you to fill your elk tag in September, mm -hmm. and then I can be more selective in there November. You there you go. However you want to do it, I'm I'm open to whatever. <laughs> but I'm doing a lot of elk hunting this year. You are. Yeah. Uh, so with the when you you asked me, you know, Randy, what is your strategy? And the strategy. So here, this spreadsheet has a calendar. Wow. And it's where are all these opportunities that I have openings or what's already locked in? What do I have to be really careful at? You notice how secretive I am? I pulled up the 2018 version. So this is all Man, history. I was looking at that with excitement. Now I'm... <laughs> I just saw you had it extended clear out to January. There's opportunities to hunt clear out into January. Oh, yeah. But that's not elk. That's deer. But there um, are elk hunting opportunities in January. Really? Yeah. Where at? Uh, here in Idaho. What are you talking about? Uh, there's some cow hunts. Really? I did not know. Yeah. Oh, well, in Montana, we have some cow hunts yep. also. Yeah. Um, whole nother topic of, you don't, know, <laughs> you don't want Randy to dive into shoulder seasons. I would. Well, that's, uh, that's been our number one requested topic that we touch on is strategies yeah. for hunting cow elk. Okay. I'm, I'm good talking about cow elk strategies, but I'm not good talking Breaking about. Breaking down the draw. <laughs> well, my, and then Montana has this kind of goofy thing that I don't want to. It's called the shoulder seasons, and no one needs to hear my my dissertation about that. But suffice to say that it's uh, low on my list of, of things that I'll ever be caught doing. And I have no problem if someone else goes and does it. And it's not because it's cow elk hunting. The reason it is is because it's a politically mandated season rather than a biologically mandated season. So I gotcha. I exercise my American rights and say, you know what? I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. That's right. So, But for those who go do it, I'm happy for them. You know, fill the freezer. Yep. So, all right. Now, I'm, you did want, you put in your 2019? Yeah. Is that? So I just pulled yeah. up. I, uh, I was trying to hide it from you. Now I my got, phone. I need a screen capture. <laughs> take a picture of this. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I don't see 2019 on here. Maybe I don't have it with me. Man. Hmm. Anyhow, I, I know what my strategy yeah. is. I, we can go through it. But here's, here's how I approach it. And this is just for me only. Um, Wyoming, I, and I'm, I really didn't like when Wyoming came up with this split between the special and regular. Yeah. I, that's still so hokey. I, I think it's stupid, but I don't live in Wyoming. I'm not part of the Wyoming legislature, so there's nothing I can do about it. And they're it. probably grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I would imagine you would cause some ripples. Yeah, but I just don't think that the the draw odds that someone gets should be a function of how, how much, much they pay money. Yep. But I don't write the rules, so I'm at a point in my life where 
I can afford it, so I apply in the special draw. Uh, but and basically, that, you're paying the four hundred dollars, four hundred more, something more, just if you draw. to get in the pool that has. Right. Most of the time, better draw odds. Most of the time, not yep. always. And that's I, the, you, that prior spreadsheet I had. I have all the Wyoming random draw odds by special and regular and have the equation that if, regu- you are an accountant. if regular <laughs> is greater than special, <laughs> greater draw odds in the random, highlight that one. Uh, so I can quickly look and say, whew, but I can do that with my go hunt now also. So yep. uh, that was just a bad habit I've been carrying forward. <laughs> now through the filtering version on Gohan, I can, I don't have to do it that way. Yeah. You can so, select both regular and special and yeah. see what you can draw. Yeah. So Wyoming is first out of the box. I've got one point. Um, what I'm going to do this year in Wyoming is I'm going to look at the random odds and I'm just looking and saying, you know what? Which one of these would be a really fun hunt? I don't care if the odds are two percent. Yep, that's what I'm applying for. I know I'm I'm not going to draw because I won't have enough points in the preference part of the draw, and the, it would be a really big coup if I were to draw <laughs> one of the random ones. My wife, though, yeah, this is interesting. So, my wife has three or four points in Wyoming. She this year she said we should go hunt together. Because she's got deer points, antelope, and elk points. Wow. And but she, here's her qualifier, but no camera guys. <laughs> <laughs> so she she shot a lot of deer. She's she's really a marks person. I don't want to say marksman, sharpshooter, maybe is a better way to say it. So maybe before January 31st, her and I will do a party out, but she doesn't have very many points. So uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure what we'll do. Yeah. But. So that that might be an option, but the likelihood is that I'm just going to take my one point, throw in and say, all right, this unit takes 10 points. I know I'm not going to draw with one, right. but maybe I'll draw one of the random tags. Um, so Arizona, this is where when we get into more detail in Arizona, I'm really in a quandary in Arizona. I've got three points because I drew an early rifle tag in 2000. 17. Yeah. Uh, I, th- so this is, people ask me, why do you use, why do you spend so much time on Go Hunt? Well, that year, Go Hunt had kind of buried in there this limited opportunity hunt. And we'll get into that in Arizona. I look at that, I'm like, whoa, that's an early rifle hunt? <laughs> and it's only taken two to three points to be in the non resident uh, guaranteed pool? Yep. Oh, I'll try it. Whew. I drew. Um, now they've changed that hunt, but anyhow. And that was uh, the particular hunt I was talking about that was going to be my fallback archery hunt every three oh, to four really? years that now takes seven or eight points to okay. draw for archery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in Arizona, uh, I've got three points. I've got the loyalty point, I've got the hunter ed point, and I've got one point from 2018. So... I'm I'm really in a quandary there because I love the late rifle hunts. But there's a part of me that wants to go do late archery in November. Really? Yeah. I love spot and stocking elk. And I had a late uh rifle hunt in a unit and I I went there scouting before the late rifle season opened and the late archery season was open. I saw a lot of bulls that I think were stockable. Yep. Then the blizzard came and they dispersed and I couldn't (laughs) find any of them in the rifle season. Um, But so there's a little bit of a quandary there. Uh, We've filmed three of those limited opportunity hunts in Arizona. And a lot of people might be asking, what is that? Those are units that have less, they're not part of the core elk area. Yep. The elk have dispersed out there and are now competing with public land grazing with cattle and stuff. And so there's pressure to keep their numbers low. And here's the beauty. There's another one of these things where I'm thinking, why am I sharing this information? But I am. (laughs) It's not subject to the 10% non-resident cap. 
You put in you equal looking, opportunity with everyone else. Yeah, you're looking at me, Corey, as though, why did you just well, say I that? Just, you know, I've, there, there's a little section in the regulations with limited opportunity hunts. And right. And every uh, once in a while, those pop up with a good hunt. Right. And non-residents could draw all the tags in those units, yep. uh, those hunt coats. So for those of you who are wondering how it is that we end up filming so many hunts in Arizona, that's a little nugget there to look into <laughs> and yeah we've not shot any big whopper bulls there every every year though someone shoots a really nice one yeah and you never know if that's going to be you yep so that's my quandary in arizona this year uh and then we go to utah i'm in the because uh, i drew the wait in, yeah i'm in, on the waiting list in utah so i I don't have a strategy there, but I have a strategy for my son with his 16 elk points. I think we're, we're going to throw in for him with one of those late November hunts Yeah, because I, I just like late rifle hunts. I, I, to me, those are, those are the, the more I do them in Arizona and Montana, uh, in other places, the more I'm coming to believe that November is an easier time to kill a bull elk than any time. So yep. why do I want my son to be carrying around more Utah elk points? <laughs> so <laughs> burn them. Uh, yeah. But so I, I don't have a Utah strategy. I think I said what my Montana strategy is. I'm, I have three points. Uh, I, I'm going to just try for one of the really hard to draw rifle hunts and know that as a resident, I mean, even if you were a non-resident, you, you, you got really good draw odds for the general tag. That's what yep. I'm, I'm going to spend focus archery hunting on the general tag. Um, and much of the really good core elk area in Montana, you can hunt with that general tag. So and we'll, we'll get into more detail when we talk about Montana, but they have separate points between the <laughs> controlled draw hunts and the general, general hunt. So you can actually right. build points for the general license that a non-resident has to apply for. Yeah. Which is separate than the points you would use to try to draw a controlled hunt in the state of Montana as a non resident. Yeah. That is why we mess it up. I, that's what happens when your legislature decides they're going to tell your game department how to do things. Yeah. Let the government manage your yeah. animals. Yeah. Which the, means they manage the money that the animals produce. And, right. And whoever has their ear down at the coffee shop. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know that you could get a PhD in wildlife management strictly by getting elected to your state legislature. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea. Absolutely. But, it comes uh, with the certificate. Yeah. It says you've been elected. Yeah. So, and by the way, here are your qualifications. Here we're, we're on another tangent. <laughs> so that takes care of Nevada or, or Montana. And then... New Mexico, you talked New Mexico, about. Yeah, New Mexico. I'll do uh, a really hard one. A less hard one and then an easier one is my three choices. Uh, and they're all going to be late rifle. I'm done archery hunting in New Mexico. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've been lucky and had a few of them, but I tell you what, with the weather, it's a roll of the dice. Yeah. Um, and boy, when you hit it, it's sweet. But you, the odds are hit. <laughs> my, my, experience, my one experience in New Mexico has me not overly excited to jump back in. Yeah. And then, uh, so let's see, New Mexico. Colorado. Colorado, yep. Uh, depending on what I find out in Arizona and Wyoming, uh, if I draw one of those, I'm probably going to just buy another point in Colorado because my calendar will start filling in. Yeah. But if I don't draw any of those, Colorado, I'm looking real hard at either a fourth season hunt in November or an, uh, a first season hunt. And I think the dates this year for the first season are like October. October 13th yeah. or something like that. And it runs for five days. And I, I'm not going there because I expect to shoot a really big bull. I'm just going there because the weather's usually nicer. There's still a little bit of bugling going on. And because it's all limited entry draw, there aren't that many people in the woods like you see in the second and third rifle yeah. seasons. So uh, Nevada... I'm, I got out of the, off the wait list in 2015, so I could apply in 16. So I've got three points in Nevada. Yeah, that, having three <laughs> points for elk in Nevada is, you, you may as well have zero. Yep. 
So, so they square your bonus points there. So you have right. nine chances, right. which sounds really cool until you realize the guy that has eight bonus points has 64 60. chances. And the guy with 20 bonus points has 400 chances. Yeah. So for me, what I'm doing in Nevada is there, there are no bad elk hunts in Nevada. I've been lucky to help people on those hunts. I've had my own tag. I spent a lot of time there deer hunting with a bow. I love archery mule deer and I see a lot of elk when I'm doing that. So I'm going to go hunt and I'm looking at what are the best draw odds. By, I don't care what weapon type. Right. And I've done that and the insider tells me that the best draw odds are the archery hunts that have August dates. Yep. Why? Because the elk aren't bugling. I get that. If I'm going to, and it's an expensive tag, it's a $1,200 tag. So most non-residents look at Nevada and say, if I'm doing that, I want a good tag. Yep. A a tag with great dates. So I'm, if I were to luck out and draw in Nevada, it's going to be an archery hunt in August and I'm going to spot and stock them. Yep. So, and then that leaves Idaho. After that, uh, I'll swing for... I'm giving up on moose on Idaho. Are I, you? I well, did you see they're proposing to reduce yeah, you the guys, number of moose and yeah. mountain goat tags this all, year? All the more reason to give up on it. <laughs> I, I'm i trying to think how many non-resident licenses I've bought thinking I'm going to draw a moose tag yeah. here. And every year I apply, the, the units I apply for, the odds are always 15% or better. Yeah. There's several units that are 35 to 40% draw odds for yeah. moose. Yeah. And I've never drawn since 1996, I think was the first <laughs> year I applied. And yeah, every once in a while I get frustrated and I'd throw into the deer, elk, and antelope draw. I'm done with moose here. Heck with it. You guys can have your moose. <laughs> well, the wolves already took them there all. You go. So. so I'm, I'm going to do uh, deer, elk, and antelope. Um, I'm going to swing for the fences yeah. for elk. Um I think I'm going to try one of your November hunts. I mean, I'm probably not going to draw, but because yeah. we're capped to 10%. But unless you tell me something else that we might have to off talk. camera. We might have to talk. I, see, he's not going to He's not going to share. Well, I'm not going to share specifics. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's my that's plan. That's your strategy? That's my strategy. And if I don't draw anything, uh, I'm going to have my Montana uh, general tag. I, there's a very good chance I could end up with a Colorado over-the-counter tag. I've hunted the third season, third rifle season there many times. Uh, I'm probably going to do that if I don't have any other elk tags. And maybe you'll talk me into coming over here to Idaho for a general tag. Yeah. So I could still have three elk hunts even if I don't draw anything. Yep. So. And that's the beauty of over-the-counter tags. Yeah. Is those are always there and guaranteed yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. My so. my strategy is a little, little different this year, and you know, similar to you, I have a, a short term, a backup plan that's guaranteed, then a mid term and a, a long term strategy, and I try to keep points built up so that I always have something on the horizon on the long term, something quality every three, four, five years, and that would be you know Arizona. Uh, New Mexico, which again, isn't really a strategy, but applying for a a premium unit, premium hunt in New Mexico uh, or Nevada, which I'm still, I think I have five points in Nevada. So I've got a ways to go there, but those are, those are some of my long-term quality strategy hunts. And I'm to a point now where I've got 18 points in Colorado, so I can't draw the good quality hunt. Right. But that's a long-term strategy at this point. Yeah. Uh, so I've got enough points to draw the hunt I'm looking at there. I've got enough points to draw the hunt I'm looking at in Arizona, which will be a quality hunt. And I have enough points to draw the hunt that I'm looking at in Oregon, which is a, we don't know. There, there's potential, potentially. Potential, potential. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got enough points to be guaranteed to draw those. I've got points. I could draw Montana. I've got five points in Montana now. So the the hunt we've talked about, I could draw that. Mm -hmm. So I've got some guarantees with the points that I have, but we're going to do that Destination Elk day-by-day series again this fall. And so trying to strategize a game plan for that changes because of who we're going to hunt with, where we want to hunt, what we want to accomplish with those hunts. So 
My goal for this fall is to hunt all three species of elk. So we've got Rocky Mountain, we've got Roosevelt, and then Thule. Oh, and before before you get to that, I got to throw in, I always apply in Kentucky too. No. Oh. Uh, it's 10 bucks. Yeah. Why not try? Yeah. I mean, I... Your, your odds just went down by 400% by, by bringing that up. Everyone but. who does the same thing is like, Newberg, you are an idiot. <laughs> we knew that before you said I'm an idiot, folks. Uh, so. so I know my, my strategy, I, I'm still working on it right now. But in order to hunt Thule elk, I'm looking at the options and they're not good. Yeah. <laughs> they, California, the state, and California is the only state that has Thule elk. Right. They only offer one, potentially one, non-resident elk tag in, in, the draws in the draw for the Thule elk. Yeah. And that could be a cow that somebody applies for and draws. Once one non-resident has drawn an elk tag, they issue no more non-resident elk tags. So if a non-resident drew that one tag as a cow tag, there'd be no non-resident no bull non -resident tags. No non-resident bull tags. So you look at landowner tags. Yeah. And landowner tags get very expensive very quickly because of the fact that that's your only option. Yeah. And most of those are relegated to private land, which I've never hunted elk on private land. And I'm certainly not above it. Um, one of my goals is to shoot a Thule elk. Uh -huh. uh, just to be able to say I've shot all three species, hunted all three species of elk. Yeah. And, you know, I think the timing's good with destination elk. It would be really good to talk about the conservation efforts in all three species and what's different about them and, and how the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's hunted or conserved them and, and helped so right. that we have hunting seasons for them. So that's kind of the letting the cat out of the bag on our plans for destination elk. So Ooh. that changes, you know, I have to look at Thule elk now and figure out what my options are there. Uh, uh, Roosevelt elk are a lot easier because they're over the counter in Oregon or Washington right. or California has Roosevelt elk as well. Yeah. So that's, you know, kind of plan two is the Roosevelt elk. And with being gone on two out-of-state hunts, that kind of relegates me to hunting at home for Rocky Mountain elk. So okay. depending on what happens with getting the Thule tag, we probably will just get a point in Wyoming and a point in Arizona. Yeah. Because I don't want to draw one of those two tags and have a California tag and an Oregon tag as well. So... You, you'll figure it out. I will. I've, I've got to kind of lay back. I'm not shooting for the moon this year. This year's more of a lay back and build points in most of the states and do over-the-counter hunts uh, for all but the Thule and, and figure the Thule out. So if anybody's listening and knows any of the ins and outs, I have uh, several friends who are helping me right now figure out the Thule, but I know that the state draw is not the route that I'm going to count on. It's going to be hard. Yeah. Huh. So that's our plan. And then, uh, so I'll, I'll end up, I'll buy a, or I'll apply for a license in Montana. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked about doing a late season hunt uh, for elk there, which again, be a rifle hunt. I've only ever shot one elk with a rifle in my life. So that'll be uh, a fun experience. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we'll do the hunt of a lifetime hunt here in Idaho. I'll hunt with my children here in Idaho. So we'll get plenty of hunting in, but my draw strategy this year is definitely off from, from normal, from normal. So I'll, huh. I'll buy a point in Nevada, a point in Oregon, a point in Colorado, a point in Arizona, a point in Wyoming. Wow. And your, your sack full of points is going to get a lot heavier after it does. this year. And that's, you know, part of the strategy again of right. next year, I'll probably draw potentially Colorado and Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I'll be out of long-term strategies at that point because those are my, you know, my hunts that I've waited for. Yeah. And now Nevada will be at six or seven points and it will take that place of my long-term. Huh. So, uh, you've intrigued me with this Thule thing. <laughs> I, I, it's never been on my radar because it, I, I'd looked at what the options are. Yeah. I'm like, hmm. But... So destination elk, you guys, what did you guys do, 40 days last year? We Sorry. hunted 20, 24, 25 days, we okay. with 19 episodes. Okay. And it was really, I mean, insanely, uh, popular is not the right word. People loved it though, just to be able yeah. to follow around. And you know, the day by day hunts, mm -hmm. we did day by day season. So it drug out our whole elk season right. and people are able to follow along from day one, every day we hunted elk. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's neat. We hunted Roosevelt elk for the first time. But this year I thought we have to have some kind of a, a focus, you know, some kind of a topic, some kind of a theme that we're following. And so I thought hunting all three species is something that mm-hmm. doesn't get talked about. Right. And just talking about the differences in how they respond, differences in, you know, the rut, differences in the body size, the antler size, in addition to all of the conservation differences and the, the habitat and terrain challenges that each of them face. Yeah. And to be able to highlight that and hopefully bring some light to uh, not only the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's efforts in conservation, but just in uh, opportunities and other yeah. things. And, you know, in future years, we might look at hunting, you know, back east or something. Right. Or Alaska has Roosevelt elk and some different, yeah. you know, off the grid hunts that, that don't get a lot of attention. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I, I'm all about off the grid stuff. Yep. That's uh, next year we've got one that's so off the grid. Uh, in two, in twenty twenty, people are going to think I've lost my mind. But <laughs> and it's not elk, so it's not relevant to this discussion. But those are fun ones to think about yep. and, and plan around. But Kentucky. Hmm. Someday I want to go to Kentucky and hunt elk in the worst way. I don't know why. See, in my my eastern state destination would be Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. I um, I guess uh, my my passion for elk in Kentucky comes from being on the board of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for six years and and seeing and knowing the people who really put their shoulder to the wheel yep. on that and uh, the. It's it's a remarkable story of of how it happened, and thank goodness for hunters having positions in policy. Yeah, uh, and that's really how it happened. Uh, and so I, I would, even if I didn't get to to have the tag, if some close friend knew I knew had the tag, who did not mind being imposed upon with our cameras. Yep. It's a story that I would love to go and tell. It is so remarkable. And I've talked to the Kentucky, I think it's wildlife and parks is what they call themselves there. Uh, some amazing people work there who are so passionate about elk. And who would ever think that we would have, depending on which survey you're talking about 11 to 14,000 elk in a state east of the Mississippi <laughs> River. <sighs> yep. That is just flat out cool. Yep. So that that story to me as as you were talking about the Tule elk conservation story. Um the the Kentucky elk conservation story is one that to me is is very intriguing. Absolutely. So well, I think we're uh Probably ready to wrap this up. You think and so? And on that note, do you have a Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation access um, I do. to share? I do, but can we do this at Quick Question of the Week? We can. So before we, we do that one? Yeah, so I've yeah. got, I, I printed off a list of them because I know we're going to I know you, bust you through are some organized. podcasts here. So um, there, there's several of them here, but I think to uh, tie in with what we're kind of talking about, um, we did have a question here, and this question came from uh, Cody Jones, and he wanted to know the best advice for application strategy for a younger but experienced elk hunter looking to put in and hunt multiple states. So, Cody, I think we just spent uh, about an hour and 20 minutes going into your question there. Hopefully, something that we've yeah. talked about here is helpful, especially for someone looking to just get in on the points game. Uh, so, we'll we'll go ahead and bypass that one. Um I think, you know, as as we start talking about the different states and going into details in each state and offering information, and we're going to talk a lot about Go Hunt Insiders. We talk about each of those states because you and I both use that personally as part of our application strategy is, you know, first thing we do is get in there and look at what our options are and opportunities. Uh, But this question comes from Clint, and it's, it's a longer one. But he says, we make clear, you and I make clear disclaimers um, that the methods and opinions we put forth are not necessarily the best or the only way to hunt elk. (laughs) For sure. That's a big disclaimer. Yeah. But that's the preferred method that we, that we 
hunt with. Mm -hmm. And he says, yet these methods, for example, aggressive calling and use of technology advances such as trail cameras and mapping products are exactly what other successful and well-respected hunters such as Chuck Adams and David Peterson claim are detracting from the hunt and changing how elk behave. Which leads to the question, do you and I, the hosts, think presenting information in a very accessible and consumable format is going to benefit elk in the long run? Benefit elk yeah. or elk hunters? Elk. So elk. I guess he follows up and says, or will elk continue to alter how they communicate and be pushed deeper into the hinterlands and potentially less suitable habitats as a result of incessant pressure by everyone with a smartphone and a pocket full of elk calls? Further, do the hosts, you and I, feel that outlining so much information detracts from some of the mystery associated with the hunt and accumulation of a lifetime experiences gained a field or by mentors? Hmm. That's a really heavy question. It is. Can, we could make a whole podcast out of that. I'll, the easy answer for me is that I operate under this premise and why I donate so much of my time to causes like the Elk Foundation is that if we're going to have more conservation advocates for the world of elk, we need more elk hunters. And to have more elk hunters, we need more successful elk hunters who are willing to, you know, not willing, because of their success and their enjoyment of being out in the elk woods, they start doing more for elk. Yep. Um, to me, that builds a bigger pie rather than each of us trying to uh, fight over a smaller piece of the pie. Yep. And I, you probably get it. I know I get it. Of why are you saying that? Why, like on this podcast, you know, I <laughs> talked about it. I threw out a couple little tidbits out there, and people uh, will say, "Why? Why? Why?" You know, let people figure that out themselves. You know, that's all fine and dandy maybe when I was growing up hunting. We learned from our dad or our uncle or whoever it was in our family, maybe our mom, maybe whoever it might be. But that's less and less the experience of, of today's hunter. Every year there are 200,000 adult onset hunters that take online hunter ed. And nobody reaches out to them and gives them any information of how to be a successful hunter. Okay. Yep. I mean, hunter Ed is about firearm safety and a few other things. Nothing about hunting. So we've got 200,000 people who want to be here and support and advocate for wild places and wild things. And we say, oh, we're just, we're not going to teach them anything. Yeah, Go we're figure keep it, it out. Secret. Yeah. Uh, I, I get what the person is saying. Um, and it's a very, uh, interesting question. Um, I, I at times wonder that, but the state agencies hopefully are managing based on what the resource has as a harvestable surplus. Yep. To, does that mean that there's going to be places where the state maybe does provide more opportunity than some would like? Yeah, probably. Uh, do I think that elk are going to change their behaviors and run and hide well there's not a lot of places to run and hide in today's yeah. world <laughs> uh, whether like it or not i yeah. mean i the other answer or the other the, another way to spin that question is well do you think it's uh helpful that there's all this workout uh, physical training, train to hunt, to, you know, mountain tough, all these really cool things that I think are helping people live healthier lives and enjoy their hunts more. The case could be made that that kind of stuff totally changes how. And, and I think that's and, included in that question. And, is. and so <laughs> Shane Mahoney is a close friend, and fortunately, He's very generous with his time to me. And we talk about this technology stuff. And uh, he said, you know, the first time somebody napped a sharp point on a rock, that was the first hunter who decided to take advantage of technology. Yeah. And the next guy was the one who said, I'm tired of throwing a spear with a sharp <laughs> rock on the end. I'm going to tie a string to two ends of this pine bough 
and let it dry and I'm going to shoot arrows. Yeah. It, I, I know that sounds like a rationalization and maybe that's what it is. Um, but I think that there's, in spite, there, there's no doubt that there are some people who are shortcutting it yeah. based on how easy it is to get information these days. But if you measure the whatever detriments you feel might be there compared to what the benefits are of having more advocates for wild places and wild things, I think the net benefits are overriding as a positive. Yeah, that's I don't, that's my long-winded that's answer. That's a great I, answer. No, I and, and I, I'm kind of the same. You know, I look at it and. And my platform has always, since I started Elk 101, been about educating elk hunters. That, I mean, that's, that's what Elk 101 stems from. The whole 101 in it is the educational side of it, to be able to share my experiences with others in a way that will contribute to their success. And I think in hunting, um, we're seeing a shift a little bit, hopefully, I think. Uh, we're in a lot of, a lot of different industries it's very secretive. You don't let anybody new in. You protect what you have. And if somebody else is successful, it takes from your success. And with hunting, I don't think it does in any way. And yes, there's there's certainly the big picture if you're looking at it. And I can see where his question's coming from of mm -hmm. if we get too successful, too many people being too successful, we're going to have limited opportunities. Right. And, and that's, that's a reality. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a bigger threat to those opportunities is uh, habitat encroachment, um, loss of public access, loss of access, all of those things that now we have a voice in politics by adding to our numbers, by getting more hunters and recruiting more hunters. We now have more people who are able to take a voice on the political side and make sure that we're protecting habitat and, and preserving what we have and conserving what we have. Yeah. And Will Primos, I had an opportunity to sit down with him for a couple of days at his home in Mississippi. And we were just talking about, you know, our children talking about um, what we do with Hunt of a Lifetime and taking youth with life-threatening illnesses hunting. And he said, it's so important that we forget about ourselves and think about that next generation. Right. And he said, we have to teach this next generation to love what we love because if they love something, they'll protect it. Yeah. And I think that sure. with us sharing information to help other people be successful, yes, we're, we're absolutely um, shortening the curve for some people. Mm -hmm. But elk hunting is tough. Yeah. And the people who are going to be successful are going to be successful whether it's today or 10 years from now. And yes, we might shorten the curve for them, but I don't see success rates changing. I really don't see them changing that much based on technology, based on, you know, anything that we're giving out as far as information. And, and like you said, the net benefit to gaining a stronger united voice of elk hunters to be able to protect and conserve elk and become members of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and support the archery industry and the gun industry and support the local state economies that rely on hunting to manage their big game I think it's providing longevity for what we love yeah, and not threatening it. Yeah, one of these comments that I had written down here, and I didn't know that was going to be the question, but it kind of falls in line to that is, and I just wrote down, being a public land elk hunter is a lifetime commitment. There is no elk hunting for dummies crash course that is instantly going to take you from no experience to 30 years experience. Yeah. Lots of resources to learn from, but the best teaching tool is the failure that comes with hunting elk as much as your time and budget allows. Absolutely. That the, and then that I, I wrapped it up by saying, if taking an elk is just a checklist experience for you, reach out to me. I have a list of friends who are outfitters. They'll provide you a great experience and you can check it off the yep. list. Those people are normally one and done. Fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong totally. with that. If, if that's, you know, if someone just says, Hey, I want to go experience it one time to see what it's all about. Hey, great. What I'm interested in is creating people who view this as their lifetime passion and their lifetime uh, activity yep. for them, for their friends, for their family. They live it, they eat it, they breathe it. 
And those are the people who are going to show up at the local fishing game public meeting. Those are the people who, when you need some spare labor, some volunteer labor to go remove a, fran- a fence and a migration route, those are the people who are going to be there. You need a fundraiser for your local banquet that's going to raise money. And I don't care if it's for the Elk Foundation or if it's for your local shooting club or whatever it is. Yep. Those are the people who are going to do that. And if we think that as a population of, of America that us being a shrinking smaller percentage is good for us, yep. I, I would just disagree with that yeah. premise. Yeah, there might be fewer people in the woods. Success rates might you know, go down. Overall harvest might go down, which for us, it's like, man, there's more elk. This is all great, great, great. Until you run into that brick wall and realize we just had our rights taken away because we didn't have enough of us standing up for something we love. Right. Or, or or we aren't doing the things that those who came before us did. Think about how challenging it had to have been in 1937 with the America American depression is still in everyone's mind, everyone's yeah. face. People who cared about hunting and conservation said we're going to impose an 11% tax on ourselves. That person didn't do that for themselves. Yeah. They did that for us who are here today enjoying it. And that's a different thing than sharing information. But there's never been any generation of hunters, and hopefully never will be, that say, this is just for me. What We've, always, we've got to where we are today by those who came before us saying, What's best for those who will come after me? And I don't care if it's the Pittman-Robertson excise tax, if it's the formation of rod and gun clubs, the formation of conservation groups, the, the list goes on and on and on that we are in the good old days. Yep. And it didn't happen by accident. And I want to make sure that people have the knowledge to feel successful and confident so that they at least enjoy the experience. Yep. They don't just give up and say, I'll never do that. And I, as quick as I say that, someone's saying, yeah, if they aren't that committed, let them give up. Yeah. Well, that's all fine and dandy. I look at it differently. I want people to have a good time and having a little more background and knowledge, hopefully yeah. and, makes and it I, a better trip for them. I'm very realistic that all the information that I've ever put out, that you and I have ever put out um, collectively is a lot, but nobody's going to be able to consume it all and go out and be a hundred percent successful every year. Somebody may be able to, not everybody's going to be able to. And I think it's going to be the same people that would have got there anyway. We might be shortening the curve and providing them with a more quality experience from the get go. uh, But overall success rates, they're not going to change. No, but whatever the percentage is, there's the old saying that 20% or 80% of the elk are killed by 20% of the hunters or 90% are killed, whatever it is. That's probably going to always be there just because some people are wired to say, I accept this challenge. I'm going to go do it and I'm going to make it something that I'd I'm serious about. And then there's going to be the casual person. And I think about the tips or content that I create, it's it's content to share some concepts and ideas, but you still got to go out in the woods. You have to apply it. Yeah, and apply it. Yep. And mess it up. That's like saying that (laughs) by providing a college education that everyone's going to be a millionaire and there's not going to be any money for anybody to make anymore because we have all these smart people out doing it. No, it creates more opportunities and those opportunities continue to increase. We look at what the Elk Foundation's done back east. And as we get more passionate elk hunters from back east that are able to come out here, go on a dream hunt and realize how incredible elk hunting is, they go back home and now they want to bring elk into their state. We expand elk hunting opportunities and it continues to grow. And I I don't know, you know, Clint, that that was a very well thought out question. I don't think he was going down that trail necessarily. More of our tactics of hunting, um, you know, as far as being aggressive with calling and all of that, are we educating the elk and and making it so that they go farther away and get harder to hunt? Um, I, again, with our tactics and, and everything, I think it all ties in. I don't feel that it's having a negative effect on elk. No. And I, 
if people feel otherwise, I guess they're going to feel that way and they're probably going <laughs> to send us a ton of emails <laughs> saying, you guys are a bunch of blankety blanks. Uh, and, and, and that's I get fine. That. And yeah, I'm sure you do. I mean, at the time, was Jack O'Connor or Jack Ward Thomas, when they were writing all this information about elk hunting or sheep hunting the or books whatever it is. And volumes and encyclopedias. Yeah. What, were they ruining... Or, or, or not ruining, but were they having the same yeah. consequence that maybe some are concerned about? No, it's every generation has communication technology advancements. And if hunters, <laughs> hunters are just, we're like the rest of society. We're going to use those tools that are available to us yep. to communicate and share information. Uh, and share a passion. I think that's, yeah. You know, that that sometimes maybe gets lost in the business side of what we do. Yeah. That this all boils down to we're passionate elk hunters. Yeah. And we've found a way to etch out a, a small little living doing what we love and not being selfish with it and, and wanting to share that so that others will develop that passion and be united with us to be able to stand up with us because we know that we're a minority in the world. Yeah. And even within our own states, you know, Montana and Idaho maybe being somewhat of an exception, but most states that have hunting, uh, hunters are not the majority of no. the population and that's that's scary. Right. No, I, and I, I look at hunting, I build this, what I call the aspirational pyramid. And there's no doubt at the very peak of that, itty bitty point of that pyramid are the sheep and moose and goat and pretty exotic and even if they're native they're quite exotic yeah. in the idea of it ever getting a chance to do it after that comes elk and elk is a very aspirational animal very aspirational hunt experience um i think that we in the hunting community can bring a lot of people together through elk and elk hunting that benefits so many things of public land, public access, uh, conservation of, of, you know, whatever landscape it might be that isn't just for elk. It's for mule deer, yeah. for songbirds, for you name it. Uh, and anyone who, who wonders about that, I would... Uh, I would suggest go and volunteer for some of these conservation projects. They're a ton of fun. I've done plenty of them and you meet great people and you feel like you're really putting your hands in the dirt and getting something done that is tangible for wildlife. Yeah. And, and those kind of things, I don't know how you measure the value of that. And I think, I'm not saying that sharing information results in that directly. But it's helpful to that end and to that cause. And uh, is there a negative to it? Yeah, you could look at it and see yeah. that there is. But is there a positive that far outweighs that negative? Yeah. And I think will more than fill any void on the negative side. Absolutely. Yeah, I hope so. so that's We're, the Sitka question of right. the week. So well, uh, I, the yeah. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has their own YouTube channel, and I would suggest everybody go out there and look at it. Um, the, this playlist that I'm looking at, so the channel is Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, obviously on YouTube. This playlist is RMEF at work. And it's a list of all of these access projects that RMEF has done. Uh, there's so many of them that, I mean, this one here I was just looking at was, it's called Bull Creek. It's just outside of Grand Junction, Colorado. Um, and Colorado has what's called the Great Outdoors of Colorado. Um, and it's used for access and easements and stuff like that. And this is just another example. I, I'm trying to remember, I should have looked it up, but the Elk Foundation in Colorado has done a crazy amount of work. Uh, what was the total here? Uh, let's see. In Colorado, RMEF has completed 704 conservation and hunting heritage projects, including two, this one is in Mesa County, with a combined value, and this isn't just RMEF, it's RMEF and the partners that they can leverage, combined value of $161 million. Uh, they've conserved and enhanced 438,000 acres, and by conserved and enhanced, that's 
Uh, might be weed spraying, it might be controlled burns, it might be, it's improving the habitat. And they've secured access to 108,000 new acres of, for public access. So uh, I would suggest anybody who wonders what the Elk Foundation does, go out to the uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation YouTube channel, grab the playlist called RMEF at Work. And this one here, this Bull Creek project just east of Grand Junction is a perfect example of it. Totally. Um, some of the other ones we're going to be talking about on future podcasts. I, I get pretty excited about these because to me, access is, it's, it's such a critical part of, of what the future of hunting is dependent upon. Absolutely. And, uh, to see the Elk Foundation now have, uh, at our last board meeting, it said that, the, the, and there's a formula for how the Forest Service and BLM tell you okay this has improved this many acres of access say it's something about drainages and yep. access you know motorized access and all this there are mef projects that they've done along with the help of their partners is now at 1.2 million acres of either new or improved public access which to me that's that's a lot of places uh, for is. elk hunters to put their packs yeah. on and grab their bugle tube and head to the hills. Go out and push so. elk into the hinderlands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, Corey, this has been a really good one. I, I like it when we're able to catch up and, and do these face-to-face. -face yeah, because our I, last few have been by phone, and it's it's good, but we just don't get the interaction. Right. You know, it's yeah, and it's different. just the reality of the craziness of yeah. schedules of two guys who are out hunting and volunteering and doing all the things that we do so speaking of volunteering i'm yeah. coaching high school boys basketball and that yeah. starts here in just a few minutes so Ooh, i am sorry well, no, no we're good I've, I've been watching the clock here so oh but we'll right. wrap this up and head to basketball practice you head to basketball practice i'm going to take care of a bunch of cpa business if Ooh. you don't mind that doesn't sound fun yeah, at all. Yeah, because earlier when you said you figured out how to eke a living out of this, yeah. I'm waiting until the day I can quit being a CPA yeah. and make a living at this. Yeah. Well, but. I feel for you. This time, <laughs> this time of year being a CPA is not a good time to be a hunter. Oh, oh, well. All right, folks. Appreciate you hanging in there. We'll have some more goodies for you here. Uh, lots Coming of good up stuff. regularly. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, guys.